now. All right, welcome everyone to today's Astroparticle Seminar. We're very happy to have here to get, uh, today uh, Xavi Rodriguez from uh, Desi Soiton. Uh, Xavi did his PhD at Humboldt University in Berlin and also at Desi Soiton. He's, uh, he's a postdoc now, now at Desi Soiton. He, he works closely with IceCube. Uh, and he is the go-to person for state-of-the-art multi-messenger modeling of, of uh, ultra-high-energy cosmic rays and high-energy neutrinos uh, self-consistently uh, between them. Uh, and especially uh, from, from uh, blazers, like uh, he's worked on understanding the diffuse flux of high-energy neutrinos uh, within the blazer sequence, for instance, and, and he's uh, uh, worked on left hydronic modeling of a blazer flare, the TXS blazer flare, and also the TKS uh, blazer. And uh, also on AGN jets as uh, the sources of high energy neutrinos and ultra high energy cosmic rays, including modeling the ultra high energy part, which uh, in, in the most detail uh, so far for the AGN uh, population. And today he's going to talk to us about all these related issues uh, about cosmic rays and EEV neutrinos from active galaxies. So, Xavi, thank you and please take it away. Yeah, thanks a lot, Mauricio and uh, Irene and Marcus for. Uh, um for having me. Uh, yeah, it's really exciting to share this stuff with you. So, um, okay, so um, yeah, do of course interrupt and discuss at any time. That would be, be great. I, I, I'm, 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 in principle, I'm gonna keep this short so we can then maybe have a more discussion-based uh, conversation afterwards. But um, okay, so let me first introduce the, the, the question, if I can, yeah, okay. So, we call the multi-messenger question, like Mauricio just, just said, basically. The relationship between these three messengers, uh, gravitational waves are, are, are not in this plot, but they're also multi-messenger. But uh, this, this is the famous, you know, uh, kind of uh, the interesting aspect that uh, you see a, a similar flux in these three messengers, in, in, the, in gamma rays, in neutrinos, and in ultra energy cosmic rays. And um, we know there is, um, let me just take this away. Um, and we know there is, um, there seems to be a, a fraction of, uh, of heavier uh, cosmic rays that are heavier than protons at the highest energies here. Uh, so we have basically nuclei interacting, you know, uh, doing photo, photonuclear interactions and producing these neutrinos somewhere. Um, and um, today I'm going to basically, uh, uh, let's say, explore a bit the idea of what if AGN um, uh, active galaxies are um, are behind this. So, um, okay, so we have PV neutrinos observed by IceCube and other future, current and future experiments. We have the extremely high energy neutrinos, okay, uh, uh, which future radio neutrino telescopes are going to you know, give us more insight into, and we have the ultra energy cosmic ray nuclei, and how these how these relate is the question, and specifically uh, using um, the let's say the paradigm of AGN. Um, okay, from the neutrino side, we all know there is a, a, a flux the, detected up to some fifty PeV that should not be atmospheric. Um, so these are the astrophysical neutrinos that we do observe. And then, um, like I said, these future experiments are going to give us a new window into extremely high energy neutrinos. And, um, and in the PV you know, uh, regime, in the ice cube regime, what we, what we do see in principle is that these, these, the, 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 the directions of the neutrinos are not correlated with catalogs of sources. Okay? We, we, there isn't one source type that we can point to. Uh, that we can say, um, you know, that we can find a, 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 a perfect correspondence. But uh, there are hints that start to emerge. Sorry, I'm having sometimes troubles switching the slide. Um, there are hints that are starting to emerge. So here, um, let me discuss some of them. In 2017, there was a neutrino event that was both temporally and spatially coincident with the Blazar TXS 506 plus 056. This is a, um, yeah, it's a Blazar, so it's an AGN whose relativistic jet is pointing towards us. So at that moment, we saw a gamma ray. There was a, a half year long gamma ray flare, and there was a neutrino 
coincident with that position coincident during that half year flare. So that could indicate already, you know, cosmic ray interactions, um, which produce gammas, which produce neutrinos, right? Um, also, we then looked back into that source and we found that back in 2014, 2015, there was also a significant um, signal from that source, uh, you know, we're looking specifically at that at that point, of course. At this point, we're saying, okay, let's let's look at the source. Is there something? And back in 2014, uh, 2015, there was um, a, there was a, a significant signal also from that source. Okay, so that's further evidence. On top of that, there's been now dozens of individual coincidences, not temporal coincidences with a flare like in, like the case of TXS, but there are high energy uh, neutrino events whose direction is well uh, reconstructed that point uh, in the direction of sources. And one of them that I will also show briefly afterwards uh, is, is this PKS 1502 plus 106, which is another blazer. Okay, uh, on top of that, you can then do time integrated searches. Okay, and this is what we have here on, on the left. Um, we see that the hottest spot in the Northern hemisphere if we integrate the 10 years of ice cube data, is very close to the direction of NGC 1068. That's another active galaxy. It also happens to be a starburst galaxy. It has very strong star formation, but it also hosts a, an active nucleus. Okay, so this is what, what, we, what we see. Uh, and there's also you know, other, other sources that, that you know, uh, for which there are also significant excesses. Uh, so here we have, to BLX uh, as an example, these GB6 and PKS24. So, you know, overall, the, we, we see that evidence is starting to emerge, um, but the, the picture isn't, isn't clear yet. Okay, so now let me introduce the, you know, kind of the hero of today's <laughs> tale. Uh, when we talk about AGN and specifically when we talk about blazars where the jet is pointing towards us, uh, I'm going to introduce this difference now because it's going to be important for our treatment of this, um, of, you know, of, of, of this of the theory we're, we're trying to, to, pick, to make a picture of here, uh, which is the difference between a BLAC and a flat spectrum radio quasar. I'm sure all of you um, know this, but I will um, nonetheless um, explain briefly. So BLACs are essentially, we think that in principle they have um, a bare jet. Okay, so basically we have the supermassive black hole, which accretes matter, the, hence being an active nucleus, um, and, and launches a jet uh, in, our, in our line of sight. In the case of fat, flat spectral radio quasars, um, we see strong broadline emission from the center, from, from the core. And this tells us in principle that there is gas surrounding the, the the, the supermassive black hole, the central engine, and this gas is being uh, excited by the uh, thermal emission from the disk and is emitting its own atomic emission. On top of that, there is often uh, dust which obscures the, the nucleus. If you look at it, you know, in, in other galaxies where you look at it sideways, when you look at it, uh, you know, uh, when we're talking about a blazer, you're looking at it through the jet, in this case, uh, of course, the emission is is dominated by the non-thermal uh, interactions in the jet, but um, in in some cases you can get hints of what surrounds the, the black hole. Um, okay, so these these two uh, different uh, these two sources require um, different um, physical models. So the simplest model is a one zone model. Okay, uh, which um, in which basically we have a region in the jet with a certain size. The size can be constrained, for example, by the variability time scale that we observe, uh, which in principle tells us how fast the, the radiation is escaping. Um, and these electrons and possibly cosmic ray protons or cosmic ray nuclei uh, that are accelerated are interacting with their own non-thermal radiation, producing neutrinos, gamma rays, and all sorts of uh, other frequencies from P gamma interactions. On the other hand, in FSRQs, the picture is more complex, and here we can have external field models where, on top of their own non-thermal radiation, these accelerated particles can also interact with these external fields, with thermal fields, with atomic 
broad lines. So all of these are potential targets for interactions um, and potential neutrino production and, and multi-wavelength signatures potentially as well. This is in the case where this region is close enough you know, to, the, to the black hole. Obviously, if it's very far down, then all this, this radiation is going to be highly deboosted, relatively deboosted in the jet frame. And then we're back to the one zone model, like in BLX. So like I said here, cosmic rays interact with these, with these external fields. It may boost neutrino emission. It may attenuate gamma rays. But that's not always the case. It really depends very much, as I'm going to discuss briefly, on the properties of each, of each source, on the temperature of, of the disk, um, on the size of, of all these things. So, and um, OK, so this, to start the, the whole discussion, I have here this from my first paper back in uh, 2017. When I started, I started the, my PhD in 2016, and I started working on this. And this looks like a very obvious result, but um, uh, but it is it is an important one. So uh, what we did is, if we apply these models to a very simple um, um, a very simple model to 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 a to AGN of different luminosities. So this here on the x-axis is the luminosity in gamma rays. What you see is that very bright sources are very good at producing neutrinos, at converting the energy in the accelerated cosmic rays into neutrinos. Okay, This is the neutrino production efficiency. One here would be all the cosmic rays are turned into neutrinos. Uh, that, 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 that never actually happens, but uh, you see that the powerful sources, uh, and most of those powerful sources are FSRQs, are quasars. Okay. Um, they are better at producing neutrinos. And the opposite happens for cosmic rays. When I inject cosmic rays into a very powerful source, they cool, they're not emitted. So what we call here the transfer efficiency or, or whatever you might want to call it, becomes very low for very luminous sources, very bright sources. While uh, sources that are have lower luminosity, they accelerate cosmic rays and they emit everything they accelerate. So as soon as the cosmic rays are accelerated there to a certain energy, they're emitted. Neutrinos aren't produced, as you see here. They're simply emitted with the same spectrum that they're accelerated to. So in a way, this makes this question that I introduced here even more puzzling, right? Because the brightest sources are the ones that are good at producing neutrinos. So that, that, makes, the, that makes this even more constraining in a way, and even more weird that we don't see them uh, Coincident. So these are the questions, uh, multi messenger questions from the AGN perspective. This is what I'm going to be talking about. Okay, because it's a seminar, I'm going to have like one or two very technical slides uh, just to kind of let you uh, in on the methods, a little bit on the methods that are going to underlie the, the simulations and the modeling and the theory that I'm going to be discussing. So let me guide you briefly through the workflow of one of our source simulations, the way, um, the way that we actually get the results uh, and, and, and can make the estimates. This is from Leonel Moirhon's thesis, um, who also works on, on, on these models. And this is the schematics of, one of, uh, of a numerical simulation of a, of a one's one model with or without external fields. But this is the schematic. So you start with accelerated electrons and also cosmic ray nuclei. Okay. This is an assumption you make. You assume that particles are accelerated. Once you have the electrons, they interact, and we calculate these leptonic interactions with the magnetic field. So electron and B field produce synchrotron in Compton. So this is calculated numerically, time dependently, step by step what emission we get. And it's, it's basically numerically integrated. We get a photon spectrum from these interactions. And then at the same time, we have cosmic ray nuclei also accelerated in the same blob, in the same zone. And then they interact with the photons that are produced by the electrons. As they interact, they lose their energy um, partially. Uh, so they cool. They produce, and they produce um, here a bunch of secondary particles. Uh, Cosmic rays produce neutral pions, charged pions, 
uh, you have then the cooled nuclei. If you inject a certain, if you accelerate a certain isotope, say if you accelerate um, silicon nuclei, they're going to break up and they're going to produce lighter uh, daughter nuclei. So they're going to create this cascade. And each one of these elements is going to interact in its own way. And so you have to keep it, you have to have a table basically of interactions and what species, what uh, cosmic ray isotope does what and produces what. Maybe some of them are uh, beta emitters or you know, stable or unstable and so on. So as the cosmic rays produce neutral pions, as we know, the neutral pions decay electromagnetically, they produce gammas. The, some nuclei also decay um, spontaneously. Uh, and in, in that case, those decays produce photons. Usually, nuclear decays produce MeV gamma rays, more or less. But because these are ultra-high energy cosmic rays, uh, in some cases, these gamma rays can actually be observed as all the way up to TeV energies. So we can get very high energy gamma rays from decay of unstable isotopes. Because once you have an isotope that is accelerated, and it interacts, it can create secondary nuclei and they can be unstable. Then uh, you have nuclei, like I said, nuclear cascade and charged pions. The, the charged pions produce pairs. The nuclei also produce pairs. Um, photons, very high energy photons, also interact with low energy photons, also produce pairs. So the neutral pions produce photons. These photons are going to be you know, accounted for as well, because now these photons are also going to, uh, to interact. And all these pairs also radiate synchrotron and inverse Compton. And so they also have to be accounted for. Okay, so these are basically the cascades. Um, in the end, after all of this is kind of self-consistently accounted for, you get photon emission, uh, you know, which may or may not have some hadronic signatures. Hopefully, it has hadronic signatures, then we can probe the cosmic ray acceleration. And this produces neutrinos um, from pion decay, also neutrinos from nuclear decays, and produces a spectrum of cosmic rays. Uh, are, are there questions on this technical? You know, this is the, the boring part, the technical aspect of the methods. But... I think Marcus, Marcus has one yeah. question. I, uh, not, not on this slide, but on the, the previous slide where you showed the cosmic ray efficiency. Uh, so how do I, so the turn down of cosmic ray efficiency at higher scales, can you comment on that? Is that uh, the, I mean, effective efficiency, effective efficiency yeah, um, of um, cosmic ray interactions in the environment? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. So they get accelerated, but at, at, at a certain threshold. Mm -hmm. They interact in the cool. So the source becomes optically thick, basically, to cosmic rays. So their so energy the sweet, is converted. Yeah. The, the sweet spot would be to multiply these two curves. Yeah, the sweet spot would be where you get, if you're talking about potential neutrino and cosmic ray combined sources, yeah, the sweet spot would be somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, where you have like somewhat high neutrino efficiency, still somewhat high cosmic ray efficiency, you yeah. can get both. But this, of course, depends on what the acceleration actually is, how high these energies are. But here in principle, we're talking about, uh, you know, up to, you know, from PV onwards and energies. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's exactly right. yeah. the sweet spot would be in the middle. Yeah, the sweet spot would be in the middle. And then all the other sources are in principle, this already tells us, hints at, which is kind of a result that we also show afterwards, hints at a decoupling of these two populations. It hints at a decoupling of neutrinos and cosmic rays. You know? Of, of the sources of, of these two, yeah. So, Shavit, now that you have this slide here, can I ask a question as well? Yes. Uh, uh, how should I understand these? I mean, uh, do these depend on how you are splitting the total available energy between photons, neutrinos, and cosmic rays, or is that what I'm looking at? This is um, this is assuming all the sources accelerate cosmic rays in the same manner, and then you let them interact, you run a simulation of these sources. And what you get at the end is this, is like after you have a flare, a hadronic flare, how many of these cosmic rays survive? How many of them are converted into neutrinos? So this is, in a way, this is, a, 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 this is the, the summary of the results 
of many simulations, each source is a is a, is a hadronic simulation. But but, but I guess method, something like this. Method. Implicitly, there is an assumption about how the available energy in the system is split between cosmic rays uh, and photons and and neutrinos, or is that something that comes out so consistently from your simulations? Um, this is not something that, in principle, is 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 actually relevant for this because the only thing that you do need to assume to make an assumption on is the co the cosmic ray loading, the baryonic loading, which is a bit like you said, like what is the is it in equilibrium? It, do, you, do you inject the same amount of proton uh, energy, uh, you know, power in protons as in electrons, or more or less? And this we call the baryonic loading, right? How many protons are there compared to electrons compared to photons? Once you do that and you inject a certain amount of protons, then this you know, kind of result is, not, is, is no longer assumption dependent because those protons are going to always, well, you do have to make some assumptions, of course, on the size of the source. Or, you know, so here we make some approximations or some averages. But once you do that, those protons are going to interact in a certain way with the photons. You see, and that gives you this result. So, um, and uh, the interesting thing as well is that this result actually doesn't depend on that baryonic loading that I mentioned, because this is dependent, this is a, a ratio between how many cosmic rays you inject and how many you get at the end. So that ratio doesn't depend on how many cosmic rays you, you know, you, how much power you accelerate. This is just the ratio between the, the neutrinos and the cosmic rays, the cosmic rays and the cosmic rays, you know, and so on. Got it, thanks. Cool. Okay. So moving on to more um, to less technical things. So, so this is just an idea of how we simulate each source. And now I can show you the, an example of a result of one of these simulations and what it tells us about neutrino production and about AGNs and about, about these things, which is this one. I mentioned already the source before. It's the PKS1502 plus 106. I think there's a, yeah, there's a typo there. Uh, 1502 plus 106. So this is a source that is very, uh, very distant indeed. It's at uh, redshift 1.8, so 14 giga parsecs. In spite of that, it's the 15th brightest Fermi source. So you can imagine that it has a very uh, high intrinsic luminosity, so to speak. So that makes it already a very interesting source. And then uh, in 2019, there was a, a neutrino event, an ice cube, very high energy neutrino event from a direction compatible with the source. And uh, what we have here is we modeled it. Of course, we're interested to know what's happening. Can it produce neutrinos? And we modeled it using this something, something similar to this, except we're not, in this case, we're not considering cosmic ray uh, nuclei heavier than protons. To simplify, we just consider protons here and electrons. Um, and um, what we see here are three data sets from three different, um, so each data set here in the same color is quasi simultaneous from the source. And this one we call a hard flare type state. We put a threshold in the Fermi photon index. And that way we, we can classify two different types of Fermi flares from the source, a hard one and a, and a soft one. They're both flares, but the index is different. Then we have the quiescent state, which is in blue. And this is the result of one of these simulations where we assume that PEV cosmic rays are accelerated, of course, because we want to explain a PEV neutrino signal. So we need PEV cosmic rays. And then we simulate the interactions. And, and these are, these are the, the three results for this. So basically with the same model, by changing the properties, by increasing the cosmic rays temporarily, for example, you can explain a hadronic flare that then disappears. Okay, um, so the, the, it's, it's a one-zone model. It is an external uh, field model. So these components that I mentioned, because this is an FSRQ, it's a very powerful quasar. And so these fields are going to, to be important. Okay, they interact in the jet. Um, and, and, and these are the results. So what's, what's interesting here, well, there's several interesting, interesting things, but um, here the quiescent state is actually in principle compatible with a purely leptonic solution. So electrons alone can explain it. In that case, you are here down and you see no neutrinos. But a small proton component improves the fit and then you do get neutrinos, which we want because the neutrino that we observed from PKS came during this quiescent state, which 
I mean, it's not intuitive if you look at the model because you get more neutrinos during flares, but it also depends on how, how much time the, the source was in the quiescent state. Because if you observe it for 10 years and it spends most of the time in the quiescent state, it starts to become more probable that you're gonna observe a neutrino during the quiescent state. And small hadronic flares are going to produce less neutrinos, total fluence in a time integrated. So that's also an important factor. But this model, yeah, predicts something like one neutrino uh, in 10 years during the quiescent state, which is what we observed. It also pr predicts a few neutrinos during flares, which we didn't observe. But yeah, it's um, with Poisson statistics, it's, it's you know, hard sometimes to, to, to draw conclusions. So. <laughs> um, but it does tell, tell us something. And what I find interesting here is that, so this is the, this pink flare, but I've separated it into the different components. Blue is synchrotron, the other blue is inverse Compton. And then these green, orange, and yellow are hadronic components. So uh, green is when fo it's photon photon pair production. Ye uh, yellow is proton photon pair production. And the, uh, sorry, the orange and the yellow is p gamma interactions. All these happen here at PV, but then in the source, they cascade down. Okay. So these, these gammas and these original gammas are going to cascade down because of. You know, these pairs are going to be produced and the pairs radiate. What I find interesting here is that although in this solution here for the soft, what we call the soft flare, the baryonic loading is something like 100, more or less. So temporarily, you're increasing because we know in principle you can increase the proton luminosity above the Eddington limit temporarily, right? Because it's, it's, not, it's not a stable, let's say, solution. It, it you know, it accretes. A lot of bunch of protons at once produces a flare and then stops, and that's what's what's happening here. We have a ten, a hundred times as many protons as electrons, and yet in optical and in Fermi, the solution is just a normal inverse Compton solution. So if you don't look at X rays or at the you know uh, very high energy range, this looks like a completely like. Exactly because of that, because the, the hadronic signatures cascade down. What we do have in hadronic signatures here is here these X-rays. And what I find super interesting about the source is that these two flares, these two flaring states, I did not find any solution purely leptonic. So in other words, only with electrons, I didn't find any way to explain how come you have such a soft X-ray spectrum here that then hardens very much and explains it for me, uh, except a, a proton component or a two-zone model or three-zone model or four, or whatever, or many, but that becomes less interesting in a way. So if, if you assume one zone, then protons are actually, um, okay, yeah, uh, like, like I said, just in, in the simple model, then protons are actually the only solution to explain the flares. In the quiescent state, you can, in principle, have, like I said, no protons. That would be down here. It's still one sigma away from the observations. And then during flares, in principle, you need the protons. So the protons interact, the cascades explain these uh, x-rays. And then it goes up very, very hard. It, it hardens. And that's how you explain the Fermi spectrum. OK. Um, let me know if you have further questions. I'm going to move on. So this is just to give you an idea of what results and what physics we can get with this type of model. So, now, sorry, yeah, maybe ahead. maybe one question about yeah about that. So uh, you said you need the protons um, for the mm -hmm. for the flaring state. I guess that the flaring happens when when the the, when the blazer is active. Uh, but my guess is that the matter that it's in falling has a certain composition mass composition right and um the I, mass you're, ta you're talking about the cosmic rays no no what i mean is uh the flaring happens because there is some uh accretion or or something is falling on, on, onto the supermassive black hole right or something is being destroyed uh, yeah for example center. for example uh, so my, my guess is that that matter is, is made with a certain mass composition that is not only protons, right? And at, at that point, wouldn't the nuclear composition become important? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, like I said, so this is, a, you know, to, to simplify, we didn't get into composition. Uh, in, in principle, yes, you're right. 
there could be a heavier we don't know how, how heavy the, the, the nuclei are that get uh, accreted, right? In principle, yes, you can have, of course, a galactic composition, for example, right. of cosmic rays. In principle, you can get a similar solution, you know, theoretically, like in general, you can get a similar solution with cosmic rays because with uh, heavier than protons, you know, because they do similar processes. What we didn't do is we didn't go and calculate now, for example, for a, you know, for, for example, a galactic composition, exactly what the properties should be to get a result like this. Okay. Um, but in principle, yeah, you, you should be able to, that, that's fair. to do that, the more fine-tuned thing, yeah, for sure. Good. Uh, I think Enrico has a question. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I'd like to ask you what is your assumption on the acceleration mechanism, if, if it is happening in this one zone, if it is at the forward shock or it's other process, uh, well, uh, independent. Okay, so so what for this case, what we know is that it shouldn't be like something like shear acceleration where the cosmic the cosmic rays have to be in the zone, in, in the in the blob, because they interact there. It can't be, for example, shear acceleration or like reacceleration. You know, we need the protons to uh, penetrate the jet itself, okay, because they need to be in this zone. So there has to be acceleration happening inside the jet in this blob, and it has to be doing accelerating electrons and protons simultaneously um that's that's as much as we you know apart from that then we just assume that the mechanism leads to a need to the minus two power law and then like fermi acceleration and may i ask what's the standard uh, time scale for acceleration uh um yeah it depends on on the yeah it depends on what efficiency you assume so here, what we what we do is um, we fix the maximum energy that we want to to obtain. Uh, the, the maximum energy itself is is obtained self consistently because um, because of you know the the, the 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 cooling losses. So at this point, you have something like a PV proton is interacting efficiently and is also be getting accelerated up to let's say a PV efficiently. After a PV, they cannot get accelerated anymore. The size of the, of, of, of the region here could be something like 0 0.1 parsec or something like that. And at that point, we have 0 0.1 parsec. You have, that's the point where the acceleration time scale is the same as the, the interaction time scale and so on. So you can, you know, based on that, you can, you can basically do the math because it's, it's the optical thickness of, of the thing. So one PEV proton has, uh, has an interaction uh, um, length of 0.1 parsec here. And that's where the acceleration in principle, the acceleration should be similar to the energy losses. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So in principle, if you have like 0 0.1 parsec, you know, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that tells you something about uh, also about the possible duration of flares. In principle, you shouldn't have very long flares in a region that is, right, that is small, that is 0.1 parsec or, or whatever. So you should have like, for example, a month long flare, hadronic flare can happen here, would be natural to expect, let's say, a month long flare, for example. Okay, thanks uh, for these questions. Um, and now uh, I would like to move on then to how does this w apply to the entire population of, of um, cosmic rays, because that's what I came here to talk about, uh, the entire population of AGN, sorry. Um, and now we are going to actually think about the possibility that AGN, by and large, don't accelerate protons or cosmic rays to PV, but they accelerate them to ultra high energies, okay? Because we know that they're coming from somewhere. Let's assume they, it's, it's the AGN. And what consequence does that have? You can also ask, what if all the sources are like this? They accelerate up to PV. What consequence does that have in the multi-messenger observations? And that's also a, a question you can ask. Um, I can get into it afterwards as well. We also did another work on that. Uh, but I'm going to just focus on here on the question of the extremely high energies. So let's assume AGN overall don't actually act like this, but they can also 
accelerate cosmic rays all the way up to EEV energies. And, 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 and what the consequences are for this multi-messenger picture that I mentioned in the beginning, using similar models. Okay, so that's why I introduced the model here as well. And for that, we take a cosmological distribution of AGN. Okay, here you have the redshift. This is the work by Marco Iello and the uh, collaborators. Um, basically, uh, here you have the, uh, so that's redshift, that's gamma ray luminosity. Sorry, and here you have the uh, Fermilat sensitivity. So below this curve, we don't observe these sources. They are either too far or too dim to be observed. And you see that most of them are actually too far to them to be observed. Um, and a few of them we can actually observe. So when we talk about um, when we talk about uh, coincidences, okay, between sources and neutrinos, we're talking about these sources here, because these we cannot observe any coincidence. We don't see the source. Uh, um, okay, so these are the three that I mentioned before, the three coincidences. TXS and PKS. And below, these sources should exist based on these cosmological distribution models, but we don't actually know how the distribution really looks like. Um, but, you know, obviously they're going to also behave, in, you know, in a similar way, so they should produce neutrinos and, you know, they, they can produce um, diffuse fluxes. Okay, and now this is the <laughs> second technical slide and the last one, which is um, from source modeling, how do we now couple it to propagation model? So um, we start here with um, assuming AGN accelerate cosmic rays to ultra energy, like I said. And one possible way to do that is through um, re-acceleration of cosmic rays surrounding the jet. So the jet picks up cosmic rays that are around them, re around the jet, re-accelerates them, for example, through shear acceleration. There is one paper uh, by um, Barek and Caprioli on the espresso shot mechanism. This is one possibility where the cosmic rays are re-accelerated and they've shown that through that mechanism, we can actually obtain ultra high energies in AGM. Okay, so we assume that and we assume a galactic composition. Okay, now coming back to also what Mauricio had asked. In this case, we are, because we want something more realistic in the cosmic ray sector, we can't do this just, just with protons. So we assume a galactic composition more or less roughly galactic. So mainly protons, a little bit less helium and so on, up to iron and almost no iron, but a little bit of iron, uh, uh, something, like, some, some, something like that is accelerated. And then we take these assumptions and we do the source modeling similar to what I showed you before. Then we assume a luminosity dependent photon spectrum, something like the blazer sequence, where you assume that sources behave all the same in the same luminosity. Then this is an assumption you also have to make. You can't, or you can, but we haven't done that yet. Simulate uh, self-consistently all the sources, you know, individual at individual level. You have to make some assumptions, and the assumption here is that at the same luminosity, all sources behave the same. Then, from the source modeling, we get ejected cosmic ray nuclei, and we get source neutrinos, and then these cosmic ray nuclei, we do the, you know, numerical simulation of their propagation. So they propagate, they interact. During the propagation, they produce, you know, secondary. And here, then we input the assumption of the cosmological distribution of, by Aiello that I mentioned before. So we now have the whole, you know, all the, the 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 ingredients to the recipe. Okay, so we have a source distribution, we have a source model, we have a propagation model, and then in the end, what we get the results is we have a flux and a composition of cosmic rays. After the propagation, we have neutrinos that come also from um, both from source and cosmogenic, and we can now compare to you know make estimates for observables. Okay, this is our main kind of domain result, which we published recently. Um, we don't touch the composition. We this is a very simple, in a way, very simple study. I mean, there's nothing simple about this because the method, you know, the methodology is like. A, a kind of, uh, you know, all these codes doing different things, but, um, you know, conceptually, it's very simple. We don't do any kind of fine tuning. We just take the galactic composition and see what we get. And this is what we get. So in principle, under certain conditions, we can explain the Auger spectrum with AGN. These are low luminosity BLX that dominate. Okay, so here, these sources dominate the cosmic ray spectrum. While FSRQs here 
as I, as I will show briefly, are limited because they are such good neutrino emitters that ice cube data limits the contribution of FFRQs to the ultra energy cosmic wave spectrum. Uh, yes, I think Anatoly has a question. It's someone with an A. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, it's me with an A. So you said you're using just galactic composition. What is mm -hmm. this? Like, what is the galactic composition? Uh, we, we took it from, from um, Barik and Caprioli's work. They basically simulated uh, espresso shot risk acceleration, and they get a certain ratio of protons, helium, silicon, and uh, iron, and we take that ratio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, OK. So, so it's something like 30% here. Yeah, the espresso. Yeah. Which is interesting because uh, but I can get that in uh, afterwards. It's in the espresso mechanism. The it's a re it's a shear acceleration. So the cosmic rays in that case don't actually enter the jet; they're just accelerated. But like I said, low luminosity VLX are the ones that dominate this anyway. And there, you don't have photoadronic interactions anyway because they are very dim. So in yeah, other right. words, in that case, the model, you know, the model is basically sim similar to just a box where the cosmic rays get accelerated and go out immediately. So in that case, mm. shear acceleration makes sense. For FSRQs, to, to get the neutrinos, you do need the cosmic rays to penetrate the jet. And then shear acceleration doesn't really make sense. But in that case, we can just be agnostic about what's happening there in terms of acceleration because we don't, they don't contribute any way to the ultra energy cosmic ray spectrum. So okay, in that yeah, case, we're thanks. agnostic. Yeah. So it's a, it's a kind of, yeah, it's a kind of game we're playing, but, uh, but in principle, it's all physically motivated. Okay. And then there's the high luminosity VLX, which are some, somewhat in the middle. Okay. This is the composition we get. So as you can see, it's not a good fit by any stretch of the imagination, but it does have the general, show the general trend obviously, of getting heavier, okay, with energy, which we see, the sigma x max also decreases. So, which tells us something about the, you know, the, 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 the mixing of the cosmic rays, like how, you know, how many different isotopes you have, uh, you know. So, so these trends are similar, but it's not a good fit because, uh, like I said, we didn't scan for this, okay. We literally just take the Mbarek and Caprioli, uh, injection or acceleration as a composition, okay, which obviously is a, an oversimplification. And so, you know, there's definitely some follow-up work to be done in terms of fine tuning this. But like I said, the point here is to be more like on the conceptual side, you know, to, to, to make this point. Okay, and then on the neutrino sector, so this is now the other plot, I've put it aside and on the, in the neutrino sector, this is what we obtain. So this is a kind of a, 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 a lot of stuff going on in this plot, but so in blue, we have source neutrinos and in orange, we have cosmogenic neutrinos. And these are ranges, okay? The minimum that you get is this here, okay? This curve is the minimum because it's, it's the neutrinos that come from the VLX that are producing this spectrum, okay? It's the minimum in the sense that if you say AGN have to explain the Yorge spectrum and composition, then you have this guaranteed flux which is not very exciting, it's very low, but okay, that's a guaranteed flux. And that is actually a cosmogenic flux. But the point here is that FSRQs actually improve the fit to the, although they are subdominant, here at you know, 10 to the 9 GeV, they actually improve the fit a little bit. And they are very good neutrino emitters, as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk. And so they produce a very considerable neutrino spectrum, which peaks at EEV, Okay, and this is, let's say, this is the best case scenario, okay, the most optimistic one, it's the maximum, and they are source neutrinos, not cosmogenic neutrinos. The cosmogenic contribution is here, it's subdominant. In other words, if you see something like neutrinos from AGN in this scenario, they're going to be source neutrinos, which is good, you know, you can do follow-up searches like an ice cube with future, with grand, with future, you know, Radio neutrino telescopes. You can do, um, uh, you know, similar techniques basically as as an ice cube because now that there is no, you know, there's less. Uh, you know, because in cosmogenic neutrinos, you can have deflection. You can have, um, uh, you know, the the, the time coincidence. Um, uh, all these things are are less um, um, 
less clear, right? But with source continuous, they come directly from the source. Uh, or stacking searches like in SQL. Uh, of course, for that, you would really need the very, the, the very most optimistic scenario. Uh, you'd need a lot of neutrinos. Uh, yeah, Irena has a question. Go ahead. Yes, I was wondering, since you were mentioning that this is like a guaranteed flux, if uh, we were to move towards a multi-zone model, do you have a feeling in which direction this uh, flux will shift? Uh, not really, not really. Um, I mean, yeah, it's hard to tell. I mean, basically, you're, you're constraining less, right? With the multi-zone model, I'm not sure what direction the flux would go. But definitely, it would be less um, cons less constraining because then you have many parameters and many other things can be happening. So I'm not sure if the flux will go up or down, but definitely the error bar, you know, let's say, would be greater on this. Like to say, the theoretical, you know, uncertainty, the model, the, the yeah, the, the model uncertainty would definitely be larger, you know, because this is the simplest model with the least parameters. That's what I would say. I don't know. Okay. What do you think? Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I don't have a better feeling for it. Okay, and uh, then as you can see here, because the cosmic rays peak at EV in this scenario and not PV, uh, the neutrinos also peak there. And we avoid actually, um, we explain, you know, or, or avoid the, the current ice cube stacking of it. Okay, so in this case, I have, uh, okay, I also have this to, 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 to make it clear, okay? So in this case, this flux here with peak at EV, it's dominated by very powerful quasars as we would assume, okay, this is always the case. And the interesting thing is that all the sources have very similar baryonic loadings in this scenario, actually. So BLX needs, a, so we need a baryonic loading of something like 50 in these sources, okay? In order to explain the cosmic rays. And for FSRQs, uh, not not fifty, excuse me, something something like uh, uh, two or three hundred for BLX, while FSRQs are limited to fifty. Okay, so in this scenario here, the best case scenario, you have a, a baryonic loading of fifty in the FSRQs, so fifty times as much power in protons as as you have in electrons in the FSRQs. So that's like let's say the upper limit of the baryonic loading. And for the BLX to explain this, we would need something like 300. So that's, you know, it's, it's, it's demanding a lot, obviously, that BLX are constantly accreting the, uh, you know, super edenton amounts of protons. So, you know, this is more of, um, it's, for, it's, 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 it's more of the, the message, you know, of why this matters for the multi-messenger, not necessarily saying that this is really probably dominated completely by BLX. Okay, but it's saying if BLX dominate at least the cosmic ray flux, then this is what you get. And uh, in this case, of course, you decouple from the PV neutrinos. That's, that's, I mean, that's the name of the game, obviously, because uh, in this case, we're, we're talking about extremely high energies. So you lose here the connection. All you can hope for, which does happen in this case, is that we don't violate the stacking limits of ice cube. But we can't, in that case, then the ice cube sources are some other sources on average. Okay. Uh, and then FSRQs, powerful quasars, explain extremely high energy neutrinos, and BLX would explain the ultra energy cosmic rays. Okay, so at this point, I think I'm going to stop and ask you if you'd like to discuss or, or ask questions and maybe have some. I have, I have one question about what you just said, Sophia. Yeah. So, uh, right. So in this case, the PEV and the, and the EEV neutrinos may be disconnected. And yeah. the question is, uh, within the, the AGN hypothesis of them being ultra high energy cosmic ray and neutrino emitters, mm -hmm. uh, could a different population, uh, not FSRQs, not BLX, be the ones that are making PEV neutrinos? You mean a different population, like, a... like I mean, within the the AGN population as a whole? Uh... Yeah, I mean, it could be because in this scenario, we're assuming that every source behaves the same. So this is the population. This is the entire population, right? So we, in, in this scenario, we're accounting for all the AGN that exists, blazars, and also the non-blazar counterparts. Okay. 
Okay, so that is this population because there's really only these many places <laughs> and most of them are not observable. Okay, there's like a, dozens of thousands and but we also consider the, the, the non blazer counterparts. I'm also accounted for. Um, and that's it. We assume that they all behave the same way. Okay. So in this case, we would need another source population to explain PV nutrient. Yeah. But it's an oversimplification, of course. Sorry. And, and I think Enrico has a question as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. So uh, in the plot you have on top, uh, yeah. I was wondering there, uh, in order to fit somehow or to explain the uh, this cosmic ray spectrum from the ankle to the highest energy, you basically yeah. need to saturate with the uh, low luminosity, be luck uh, and whatever. But yeah. there, for whatever is the source, you would need a super sharp cutoff. And uh, if... Uh, you make your uh, your BLAC uh, or AGM multi AGM model consistent uh, with whatever source of cosmic ray we have below the ankle. Would uh, would it change also the fit at the highest energy? So how would you be able to explain the ankle if you uh, allows for the existence of another source in the low energy between the knee and the ankle? Okay, that's yeah, that's a fair question actually. Yeah. So, because here actually the ankle itself is uh, well explained by this, right? So there is a dip basically that is naturally explained by the transition between the different components. So yeah, I agree with you. We kind of saturated, we explain the ankle alone with the source population, which means maybe that it's going to be hard to, you know, to explain that transition, the galactic, extra galactic kind of regime. Um, I, I don't really know. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, how um, how else to uh, you know to address this? I mean, like I said, it's 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 due to the to the simplified assumption that we're making, right? Which is we're thinking only of the, of the source population. Um, yeah, in this case, you would need something like ten to the eight GeV source population in the galactic extra galactic transition, which in any case is not clear, right? But something that peaks at 10 to the HEV and then subsides. I agree relatively sharply. Yeah. Okay, thanks. But uh, lowering the low luminosity be luck, for instance, the red, uh, would also the other curves, uh, FSRQs and uh, uh, high luminosity be luck, change accordingly? Or could you sort of fine tune in order to have a decent fit? Okay, so first of all, I just want to emphasize the red one is not low luminosity BLX. This this is it's the pink dashed one. That's low luminosity okay, BLX. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sorry, I didn't explain that. I apologize. The red is protons, um, uh, gray is helium, uh, green is silicon, I think, and blue is iron. Ah, uh, okay. So it's I the see. total components of everything mixed up. It's a bit. It's a lot of curves. I uh, know. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, so as you can see here, it's dominated by protons. And at the highest energies, it's dominated by iron as it should. Or, or as, as we see, you know, in the, actually in this case, you can see that it's too dominated by iron, it's too heavy. But this is what I'm showing. And then low luminosity BLX is everything, <laughs> is this. And FSRQs are subdominant. So in the galactic extra, extra galactic transition here, you have proton dominating, protons dominating, which again, we also see. Very okay, I, I, I see, I see. Thank you. Yeah. Marcus? Yeah, I have a question about um, the spectrum of the individual components. It looks like this is a very hard spectrum, e to the power minus one for the components. Okay. Is, is that point. a natural this outcome of, of this espresso mechanism? Uh, no, because the espresso mechanism doesn't uh, tell us much about cosmic ray escape, as far as I understand. Uh, here, what mm -hmm. we have is an assumption on the escape, and the assumption is a bone-like diffusion. Mm -hmm. You know, so basically the magnetic field traps the cosmic rays partially um, and energy dependently. Mm -hmm. And then proportional to energy, and therefore if you accelerate cosmic rays to e to the minus two, they escape with e to the minus one. Which we, we know we know we need in principle, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we know we need a hard spectrum. 
And if we assume Fermi acceleration to e to the minus two, then this is our assumption. And this is kind of, yeah, it's, it's how they escape. It is kind of the secret to getting a harder spectrum yeah, for Fermi acceleration. Yeah, for this for the strong transition in the um, x max distribution, you also need the sort of like a exactly. spectrum, right? Mm. Yeah, exactly. You need it, right? So mm. that's how we get it in the in the model. It's okay, just a thank really you. simple assumption. Mm. There's there's a question from Leonel in the chat. I'm going to read it. Cool. Uh, did did the injection indices for cosmic rays play any relevant role in fitting the ultra high energy cosmic ray spectrum? Yeah. The injection indices, I think he means the uh, power of the, 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 the spectral indices of acceleration. Yeah, this is, this is, yeah. So it was simultaneous to Marcus's question and it's, it's, it's basically the same answer. Yeah, it's the same. So yes, they are extremely important. Uh, it's very sensitive to it. And in this case, what we have is that we inject with e to the minus two, but they escape and get in, injected into the extra galactic medium with an e to the minus one. And yes, they are very important. It has to be hard. And we already know that, but how, how we get it is not clear. All right. Maybe I'll, I'll hazard one uh, bit of a speculative question. If you go to your next slide. Yes. Uh, so I've, 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 this is something I've, I've wondered for a while is uh, from your own experience, do you think there's any chance of if we ever measure a, a, with a high energy neutrino spectrum uh, distinguishing between cosmogenic and source? given the uncertainties in, in modeling predictions? Yeah, that is a tricky one. <laughs> that is a really tricky one. I mean, uh, um, you need statistics, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, we already discussed that in the beginning of the thing for the talk. So in my opinion, to, dis to, to distinguish them from the observational point of view, you need statistics. In this case, what we're doing is the opposite, is through the modeling, assuming a GN, then we're telling you in advance that whatever you observe is going to be source. Right. It's going to be source neutrinos, you know. So it's a bit of a reverse thing because I really don't know. Maybe someone else can also, uh, yeah, um, contribute to this, um, illuminate us more. To me, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, I would say you need, you need statistics, right? right? Which this optimistic scenario would give you plenty of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brand. So, so but my, my worry is that. Uh, even though the, the, the blue source mm -hmm. flux here can be quite high or very high, yeah. you could probably also get a, a cosmogenic flux, like a, not necessarily from AGN, but from generic sources that is almost yeah. as high. Yeah, sure. Uh, that is a good point. So, so this yeah. is disentangling them from the spectral yeah. shape probably is going to be quite difficult. That's my yeah, there could be hunch. That. Yeah, it is. I mean, it depends on the, you know, on the spectral, like you said, spectral index depends, could be different components with different shapes. Yeah. And not only that, but here, right, when you go at the highest energies, the AGN signal itself is 50-50 source and cosmogenic. Exactly. So that is, you know, <laughs> you caught me, you know, it's not, it's not that easy to just say, oh, you know, they're all sorts. It's not, it's not that simple. Yeah. 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 You have both of them. Yeah. At lower energies, in this scenario, we'd have source only, but then with the other components, yeah. That's right. Right. Yeah. All right. Is there? Uh, thank you. Is there any any final question for Xavier? I don't see any raised hands. Uh, Xavier, did, did you finish here? Did you, did you have anything else? You I did. Like? No, I'm okay. I'm uh, I'm happy with then, it. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Then uh, then thank you so very much. I enjoyed this everyone. plenty. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Me too. And uh, yeah, no, thank you. This this is great work, um, and I'm sure we'll be talking about it also offline. Um, so it, also, thanks everybody uh, locally and uh, either sure. current or former members of the Daisy Astroparticle Group that are here joining us today. Uh, Xavi, thank you very much, and uh, everybody else, uh, thanks, and we'll see each other in uh, in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much. Goodbye, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.